All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Anke Gutze, and my partner on this project is Anand Kumar. We are both, lo both located in Greensboro, North Carolina, and today we will be talking about massive MIMO and hybrid beam forming. So first, we would like to provide a small introduction into what MIMO and massive MIMO are. With the advent of 5G, the number of base stations will increase dramatically with expectations of up to 56 times more base stations during the 5G revolution. This increase will lead to an increase in overall power consumption, which can become prohib prohibitively expensive for the base station operator. Current implementations in 4G and earlier generations tend to radiate energy uniformly, as can be shown in the image to the left. This can prove to be inefficient since most of the power is not reaching the users of interest, as well as limiting the overall usable range of the base station. This was not a large problem since the cellular bands were generally at low frequencies, ranging from 400 megahertz up to 6 gigahertz, and the signal could propagate far and wide without much attenuation due to blocking items such as trees and buildings. With 5G applications moving up in frequency to be in the 24 gig to 39 gig region, which are commonly referred to as millimeter wave frequencies, this becomes advantageous since it increases the overall spectrum dramatically. However, with millimeter wave frequencies, another challenge presents itself. The attenuation at millimeter wave effectively multiplies to a point where there these signals have difficulty penetrating walls. Also, atmospheric absorption becomes a large concern as rain droplets can significantly degrade performance. Using technological advances like massive MIMO and hybrid beam forming, the base station operator can now control the direction of the energy that is being distributed to the user equipment as shown in the image to the right. By utilizing these technologies, the operator is improving the overall efficiency and increasing the range by taking advantage of antenna gain and additive energy to send a higher modulation scheme such as 256 QAM to the user. Another important aspect of massive MIMO is that the number of antennas or signal chains are generally larger than the number of users. This increases the capacity potential of the system dramatically as well since now multiple antennas can serve a single user. Next, we want to compare the current MIMO application with future massive MIMO systems and show the hardware challenges that present themselves in massive MIMO. Shown on the top is a typical 4x4 MIMO system, while at the bottom is a 192 antenna array massive MIMO system. What we can see in the 4x4 MIMO system is that the antenna sizes are generally large, and we can deal with discrete components like analog to digital and digital to analog converters while keeping the size of the system small. However, in massive MIMO, since the number of components increases by a factor of 48 in this example, to get the same size system, we need to shrink everything. This means that whereas discrete components were okay for MIMO systems, for massive MIMO, the integration becomes an important consideration. By integrating at the IC level, base station manufacturers also have fewer interconnects that they have to worry about, making the PCB design easier for them. What we see is that integrated circuit manufacturers are now focusing on combining multiple analog to digital and digital to analog converters along with a lot of the RF signal chain into a single package. A good example of this would be the 809026, which integrates four transmitters, four receivers, and four observation receivers into a single package. Also, the antenna size inherently has to shrink. Antenna size is inversely proportional to the frequency, so as antenna size decreases, the frequency increases. This makes the previously mentioned millimeter wave frequencies appealing for massive MIMO and beam forming applications. In the same vein, as the previous slide, where we talked about how size and weight are reduced through the process of integration, we can now take a look at another expense that is incurred 
and that would be power. Focusing on this receiver signal change chain, what we see now is that today's high speed, high resolution ADCs, where resolution can be 8 to 12 bits per sample, can consume 500 milliwatts or more. If we were to multiply this by the upwards of 500 ADCs that could be required in a massive MIMO system, the power consumption can become prohibitively high for a single base station. To counteract this, manufacturers can try reducing the ADC resolution to be significantly lower. For example, somewhere in the one to three bit range. Since in massive MIMO mode, the number of signal trains can be dramatically greater than the number of users, using such low resolution ADCs actually can fairly well mimic the spectral efficiency of higher resolution ADCs. We can see that on the image to the left, where the average spectral efficiency for three bits is very close to that for an infinite number of bits. By using low resolution ADCs, the power consumption and operating cost of the system can be reduced significantly. This is showing just one way in which mass and MIMO system manufacturers can reduce power consumption, but they, are, they can take similar actions across other portions of the system to better help them get lower operating costs. Alrighty, so now we're going to look at the differences in mode of radio operation. One final expense is the expense of time. For this, let's look at a comparison between TDD and FTD, and why TDD is a clear winner when it comes to mass and MIMO systems. Since TDD uses the same spectrum for both uplink and downlink, base stations can take advantage of channel rest reciprocity for channel estimation. Since FDD modes involve uplink and downlink channels operating at different frequencies, channel reciprocity cannot be harnessed. The ch channel state acquisition overhead increases as the number of antennas increase in FTD. Current MIMO systems have been part of the 3GPP spec since LTE release 8 and were designed to operate in both TDD and FTD modes since the number of antennas is fairly small to where FDD is not a bad choice. The LTE standard does not mandate beam forming, and therefore MIMO can take advantage of common reference symbols for channel estimation in FDD mode. However, due to the large number of antennas in massive MIMO, FDD would require a prohibitively large amount of time for channel estimation. Therefore, it relies on TDD operation. Base station processing requires channel state information, or CSI, and it exploits channel reciprocity in the uplink frame, as shown in the figure. The pilot signals are transmitted only in the uplink direction. Before we do a deeper dive into the different beamforming options, let's take a look at some of the additional differences between MIMO and Massive MIMO, which enable Massive MIMO as mentioned earlier, mass and MIMO systems generally have a large number of antennas compared to the number of users. This allows for both spatial diversity and spatial multiplexing. The frequency range for mass and MIMO is generally in the millimeter wave space. There are currently three bands that have been defined for 5G applications, and these would be bands N257, 258, and 260, which are all about 3 gigahertz wide and land somewhere between 24 gigahertz and 40 gigahertz. MIMO systems, on the other hand, are generally relegated below between 400 megahertz and 600 or 6 gigahertz. This means that they can more easily propagate through things like walls, but that comes at the cost of much smaller bandwidth. There are north of 40 bands defined for the sub-6 gigahertz region, and they are gen generally less than 100 megahertz wide apiece. Finally, in Mass and MIMO, by using 3D beamforming, coverage can be improved for a higher mobility, even at cell edge. Now, let's shift our focus to beamforming and talk about how it is beneficial for Mass and MIMO applications. Antennas act as converters between conductive waves and EM waves. The gain is defined relative to an isotropic antenna. An antenna, isotropic antenna, is shown on the left and is identified by the uniform radiation of power in all directions. 
by changing the design of the antenna, we can actually get something that is directive. By making the antenna directional, we can get some antenna gain in a single direction. And this uh, gain can be beneficial to counteract some of the losses seen at higher frequencies. Now, before looking at beamforming, let's talk about some of the traditional implementations of base stations. Generally, as shown on the first slide of the presentation, a wide beam is formed that serves many UEs in the cell. That would be the massive MIMO picture we had seen. There's no control over the antenna beam, which is set up during installation through a mechanical tilting of the antenna. Since the beam is serving multiple users, the resources are split between all users, which reduces throughput as more users are added. In beam forming, by using multiple directional antennas, the beam can be adjusted such that a single main lobe can be generated that is highly directional. This is shown in the image to the right, which where adding more and more antennas to the system reduces the side lobes, as well as the power in those side lobes and makes the main lobe narrower. This can be done by adjusting the phase of the signal individually on each signal chain through a process called beam steering. There are three different ways of beam forming, which are analog, digital, and hybrid beam forming, which, will we, which we will talk about shortly. Right. Continuing with the antenna design in mass and MIMO systems, we can actually place them in different arrangements as shown on the left for a particular system. The image shows 64 antennas and shows that by creating this array, we can get both horizontal or azimuth and vertical or elevation beamforming. We can get an idea on the size of these antenna panels and see that they are fairly small. It is highly, highly desirable to place all electronics, including the transceiver, power amplifier, and filtering behind the panel in order to keep the size of the overall base station to a minimum. First, analog beamforming is shown here from the perspective of the receiver. As can be seen, there is a single ADC per user that is fed by the sum of multiple RF signal chains. The phase and gain can be adjusted through the amplifier and variable delays. If the gain and phase are adjusted properly, then a beam is formed to the appropriate UE. One major issue with analog beam forming is the sheer number of components required to make it work. If we assume there are eight users and 64 antennas, then we would need 512 phase shifters, variable gain amplifiers, and 64 splitters and combiners for each antenna this would add up to be a ton of hardware and wiring, and the complexity just makes analog beam forming highly impractical. Well, now if we look at digital beam forming, in this case, we would have to increase our ADCs to match the number of RF signal chains. However, now the number of signal chains is not tied to the number of users, but just to the number of antennas. This greatly simplifies the design and comes at a cost of more computations required. Since the number of ADCs or DACs have increased, the digital interfacing becomes a bit of a challenge, as well as the processing power required. As with analog beam forming, this interfacing and computational power makes digital beam forming a little difficult to use. To get around these issues of analog and digital beam forming, a hybrid of these two techniques has emerged and it is aptly named hybrid beam forming. Hybrid beam forming takes into account having a dedicated digital signal chain for each antenna element as shown in digital beam forming. In order to mitigate this, a TR switch or transmit and receive switch is used so that one signal chain can supply multiple antenna elements. The number of switches used is smaller than the number of antenna elements, and in order to provide more flexibility, each antenna element can be connected to multiple TR modules. By using this methodology, we increase the hardware by adding the TR switches, 
but at the same time we reduce the signal change, which can actually leads to a net benefit in both power and hardware. Due to this net benefit, hybrid beamforming appears to be the clear winner in the way to generate beamforming. Finally, we want to end this by giving a view of the 5G ecosystem that is making massive MIMO and hybrid beamforming a reality. We have the IC manufacturers such as Analog Devices, Corvo, Qualcomm, Skyworks, TI, Anoki Wave, and Xilinx, who provide the integrated transceivers, the FPGAs, the beamforming chips, power amplifiers, and antennas to the user equipment and base station manufacturers. Some of the larger players in the base station manufacturing side are Nokia, Ericsson, Huawei, CTE, and Samsung. Many of these manufacturers have already started designing and testing massive MIMO systems in the field in partnership with operators such as AT&T, Verizon, Sprint, Reliance Geo, and China Mobile. Finally, we have the UE manufacturers whom are probably most familiar to consumers such as Apple, Samsung, and Oppo. By getting this ecosystem to interact together, the future for 5G and massive MIMO appears to be quite bright. Here are the references we use for this presentation. I would like to thank everyone for listening and I hope you have a good day.